We are in a sermon series on all of our Bayside campuses uh, in the Gospel of John. And we're going to be in the Gospel of John for a while. I mean, we're going to go through the whole book. So we're going to have like 20 plus weeks, and we're just going to dive big into the Gospel of John. And there's so much for us to glean from this book as we seek to follow God in transformative, empowering, and life-changing ways. So I'm just going to jump right in and... We're going to start here with the first chapter, and I'm going to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. From this text, I want to speak to you on the title, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? God, I pray that this would be your message that ultimately you would be speaking and I would just be the vessel, the vehicle that you've decided to use to say what you want to say to these, your beloved children, my sisters and brothers. God, I desire to be obedient to your word, so please let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Who is Jesus? This is a life-altering question, potentially. Who is Jesus? You know, you could say that life in and of itself is made up of decisions, that the lives we live is about decisions made and decisions not made, and depending on the decisions that you make on any given day, that is going to be some kind of expression of what is your life. Um, I have made some decisions in my life. Some of them have been pretty good. Some of them, I'm not bragging, but they've been kind of great, and there's been these other decisions I've made that have been horrible. Um, When I was in high school, my freshman year in high school, I made the decision to lie to my parents. I told my parents that I was going to the movies with two of my friends, but really where I was going was to a basement party. Another guy that I knew whose parents were going to be out of town for the weekend, and he was going to throw like this party. You know, he was like like a risky business party. That's like dating some people in here. Like there's some young people like, what is risky business? Never mind, we're in church. But I went, I made the decision to lie to my parents. Not a good decision. I made a decision to go to a party that a guy I knew was throwing where his parents were gone for the whole weekend. And so I get to this party and there's, there's, there's a DJ and it's down in the basement and there's little blue lights and there's, you know, it seems like it was going well. I mean, the decision and so far, like I'm down in this party and there's people and there's food and there's music and I'm dancing. There's this girl I like that showed up at the party. So I'm I'm thinking this decision is going pretty good so far, huh? Until a fight broke out. And during the fight breaking out, there was this big tussle. And then somebody pulled a gun out and shot. And uh, I I can't tell you that I stood around long enough to go like, oh, I wonder who's shooting in here. I think I did something like, ah! And then I ran. I don't think I make that noise too much in my life. But at that moment, that's the noise I made. And so I ran out of this house. I'm running down the street. I'm looking behind me. And I turn and I run into a tree. And I think I must have knocked myself out and staggered home or something because I woke up the next morning underneath my bed with a little knot on my head right here. And I had to explain to my mom, how'd you get a knot on your head just going to the movies? Decisions. Life is full of decisions. 
Your life is full of decisions right now. Teenage decisions, parent decisions, husband, wife decisions, single life decisions, student decisions, career decisions, house decisions, finance decisions. Like right now, what am I gonna get ready and eat later today? Decisions, life is full of decisions and um, we could say that where we are in life right now could be the culmination of some decisions that we've made or not made. But I wanna present to you three of the most important decisions you will ever have to make as a human being. And these three important decisions go something like this. Have you decided if God is real or not? Two, have you decided who God is? And three, have you decided who you are in relationship to God? Let me repeat those one more time. One, have you decided if there's a God or not? Two, have you decided who God is? And three, have you decided who you are in relationship to God? This is what the Gospel of John in an overarching way is helping readers to unpack so that hopefully when you make these three important decisions, that that will be the foundational decision making of your life so that out of the overflow of the most important decisions that you could ever decide on, all of the other decisions in life as a mother, as a father, as a husband, as a wife, as a single person, as a high school student, as a college student, as a grandparent in your career, whatever decisions you're making, they're coming out of the overflow of the greatest decisions you could ever make in your life. That is to understand the gospel of John. Now, the reason we're spending so much time in the gospel of John, like 20 plus weeks, oh my goodness, is because in the, in the Bayside family of churches, it's important to know that we take the Bible serious. I mean, if there was ever a time to take the Bible serious, now is the time to take the Bible serious. I mean, when you look at what's going on in our nation, when you look at what's going on in our world, I mean, violence as a primary means to solve conflict or, or to work through your abandonment issues or your brokenness issues, it's like people are using, some people are using violence as their way out, as their way forward in dealing with brokenness in their own soul. If there was ever a time to take the Bible seriously now is the time we also take Christ seriously and so that's why spending a, a number of weeks in one of the gospels is important because if you're a part of a Bayside church we just want to let you know right off the bat not only do we take the Bible seriously we take Christ seriously we take the things that Christ said seriously we take the things that Christ did seriously we take Christ on the cross serious we take Christ in the grave serious we take Christ resurrection Directed serious. We take Christ as alive right now through the Holy Spirit serious. So that just, I mean, so at the beginning of things, I mean, this, this church is at, at its beginning. And so there's no better way to start out as a brand new campus, as a new church in Davis without laying a foundation that we take the Bible serious. We take Christ serious and we take following Christ serious. So here from the gospel, I want to talk about three essential truths about Jesus. Three essential truths about Jesus. And I want to do this by going back to the gospel of John chapter one. And so um, let's look at the first three verses of chapter one. It says this, in the beginning was the word. Here when it says the word, it is meaning a divine expression. This means in the Greek, the logos, the revelation of God, an expression of God, a way of knowing God. So it's, it's, it's not just about what is spoken, what is uttered, it is about what is expressed and what is revealed through what is spoken and what is uttered, what comes into existence because of what is spoken. You know, when some people speak, I mean, nothing happens, right? It's just like, they're just saying stuff and it's like, it's not gonna turn 
turn into anything. It's not going to, I mean, you ever had somebody say something to you and it sounded like a promise. It sounded like a commitment. It sounded serious, but on the other side of what they said, nothing happened. Anybody ever been through that before? Somebody said something to you and they might as well not have even said it because nothing happened. But this word right here, this is about when something is spoken, something happens. And this is saying that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then it makes a transition. He, it goes from word to he was with God in the beginning through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. This is the first essential truth about Jesus. If you want to know who Jesus is, if you want to discover more deeply, you might already think, I know who Jesus is. Well, wait a minute. One of the first essential truths is, who is he? Jesus is God. That's the first essential truth. You got, we got to come to an understanding of, okay, who is Jesus really? I mean, just like person of the year, multiple times in Time Magazine, that's who Jesus is. Oh, Jesus is the person that every once in a while on the History Channel, they do a little docu-series about him. Oh, no, I know Jesus. I saw Jesus at the movie theater, and I think they got some Italian guy with some long, nice, cute hair and a cool beard to play him. And he was like so pretty. He didn't have any acne. He didn't have a birthmark. He didn't have any scratches on his face. I mean, just a pretty Hollywood Jesus. I know who you're talking about. No, uh, John is talking about God. Who is he? Jesus is God. And what we're going to find as we explore uh, the gospel of John is Jesus has a lot of statements to back up his, 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 his existence, his description, his declaration of being the son of God and being God. He says some things about himself. We call them I am statements. And there are seven of them sprinkled throughout the gospel of John that back up that that undergird that Jesus is God. He says, I am the bread of life. You really want to live? You really want to experience life? I'm the food that you need to live. He says that in John 6, 35. In John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. I light up the world. A broken world is lit up with blessing because of me. A poverty-filled world is, is lit up with empowered, transformed lives because of me. A sinful world is lit up with salvation because of me. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. John 10, 7, he says, I am the gate. You want to enter into real living? Then Jesus says, I am the gate. Walk through me. Um, uh, earlier this week, I uh, was invited to a surprise birthday party for uh, a guy that attends our church at Bayside Midtown. And the family hosting uh, the, the surprise birthday party, like they have like two little kids in their house. And so I went to their house and went through the front door. And there were like these little gates all through the house. I mean, like you could couldn't get into the kitchen without going through the gate. You couldn't go through the dining room without going through the gate. You couldn't go up the stairs to the second level of the house. I'm like, this was the most gatey house I have been to in a long time because my children are 21 and 19. So we haven't been like inside gated in like years, but like this was like the gatiest inside gatey house I had ever been to in my gatey experiences of houses with little people in them. And so uh, I, I was thinking, when I saw these little gates of how like the, the, the dad, I was watching the dad like open the gate so that the, the little child could come through and get his little glass of Kool-Aid and then he'd open another gate so he could go and get one of his toys and I thought about like Jesus saying I am the gate I open up the possibilities to what you need for life I open up the possibilities to joy and peace and empowerment and knowing that you are made in the image of God and you are special and you are valuable and you have a voice and there's no one like 
like you. You are gifted. You are talented. You are wonderfully made. When you live in a broken world that says a woman can only go so high, it's good to have an open gate to know that as a woman you can be whatever God has called you to be. It doesn't matter what skin color you have. It doesn't matter if your parents had money or not. It doesn't matter if you grew up in the hood or a farm town. God says, I am the gate. Walk through me and there is life and there is joy and there is power. I'm the gate. And he could have just stopped there, but he said, I'm the good shepherd too. That's John 10, 11. I'll tend to you. If you trust me with it, I'll tend to your marriage. If you trust me with it, I'll tend to how you raise your children. If you trust me with it, I'll tend to how you handle your finances. I'll tend to how you live your single life. I'll tend to you. You don't have to handle your stresses and your pressures alone. I'm God. I love you. I'm mindful of you. I am the good shepherd. I'm not one of those, get out of here, lamb. You know you ain't supposed to be over here. You know, I'm not one of those shepherds. I'm, I'm a loving shepherd. I'm a good shepherd. I'll let you know when you're going the wrong way. I'll pull you tenderly back towards me. And then he says in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Through his resurrection, new life is possible. 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. In John 15, he says, I'm the true vine, which means to be connected to Jesus is to be connected to God and to bear fruit out of our lives. Like if we stay connected to him, we bear the fruit of hope, of justice, of truth, of forgiveness, of grace, of unselfishness, of, of generosity, of mercy, because he's the vine. Man, I mean, that's a lot. You know, but this is also tied to knowing that Jesus is God and knowing these I am statements set you free. How do I know this? Because this wasn't the first time all these I am statements that I am was spoken in the Bible. In Exodus chapter 3, you have to read this later. We're not going to put it on the screen today because we're talking about the Gospel of John. But just to make a little quick detour, in the book of Exodus, the people of God were in slavery. They were being oppressed. They were being beaten. Their humanity tortured day after day after day through hard labor. And God speaks to Moses and says, I'm going to use you to set my people free. I want you to go to Pharaoh, the head of the nation that is oppressing the people. I've heard their cry. I've heard their grieving. I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let them go. And Moses says to God, uh, who am I supposed to say sent me? And he says, tell him I am sent me. This means that when Jesus says, I am, Jesus is tying himself into being God and being the liberator of the world. If you're enslaved to abandonment, neglect, brokenness, if your life is just upside down, messed up, tore up from the floor up, there is one who still says, I am to you. You can be liberated. You can be free to be the wonderfully made, talented, gifted, anointed person that God has desired you to be. Man, there's freedom in I am. I'm so glad Jesus says I am so many times. Jesus is God. Let's go back to the text to verse 4. Verse 4 says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, this John is not John who's writing this gospel. This is John the Baptist that John is talking about. How you'll know when John's talking about himself, and we're going to talk about this down the road, is that whenever he says the disciple who God loved dearly, when he says that, he's talking about himself. <laughs> so he doesn't never say his name when he writes the gospel, but he says, hey, and then there was a the guy that God really loved. Then there was this guy God loved a whole bunch. 
So that's, that's when you know he's talking about him. So he's talking about John the Baptist here. And so he says, he came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. So here's the second essential truth, and this is about why he came. Jesus is hope. One, Jesus is God. Two, Jesus is hope. Everything we could ever hope for, to live real life as it was meant to be, is found in Jesus. It can be discovered in Jesus. It's in the declarations of Jesus. It's in the demonstrations of Jesus. As we will go through the gospel of John and as we will discover the way that Jesus brings humanity to the marginalized, brings sight to the blind, as he lifts up those left for dead, we see that Jesus is hope. He's hope for a people that in the context of when he walked the earth were oppressed and marginalized under a a terrorizing empire. Jesus represents hope, but not just hope when he walked the earth, but hope for us right now because the things that John is talking about in the first chapter are still opportunities for you and I today. He still, verse 5, comes to defeat darkness Verse 5 says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus came to defeat darkness. This means he gives clarity. Um, and, and, And I want you to think of it this way. You've had moments in life where you were in the dark, and you couldn't see your way through a situation. Now, this could have been serious. Maybe it was a relationship and you just couldn't see your, how this relationship was going to move forward. It just, you were in a dark place in that relationship. There might have been times in your life, just alone, you felt like you were in a dark place in the soul and you couldn't see yourself forward. You couldn't see how you could get up the next morning and go to work. You didn't see how you were gonna get through the next semester of school. You couldn't see how you were gonna get through this situation with your children. There are these moments in our lives when we, when we are in a dark place and Jesus defeats the darkness. Like you can be like, I can't say to you that you'll never have a dark time in your life. I can't tell you that. I can't say that you won't go through dark nights of the soul. I can't tell you that you won't go through times of brokenness and insecurity and abandonment and abuse and and people breaking their commitments on you. But what I can say to you is that in Jesus, you don't have to be defeated by darkness. Darkness does not have to take you out. You don't have to tap out to darkness. Jesus came to defeat darkness. In the midnight hour, you can have victory. In the midst of your storm, there can be sunshine because Jesus comes and illuminates on dark situations. He came to defeat darkness. You no longer have to be lost in darkness. You don't have to be defeated by brokenness anymore. There is light for you. There's clarity for you. Second thing is he came to defeat doubt. In verse 7, verse 7 says, He came, John the Baptist came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. If there was any doubt that God loves us, that God cares, that God sees, it's God sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. There's no need to doubt. Does God even care about what's going on in this broken world? Does God even care about what's going on in my house? 
Does God even care about what's going on in my job? Does God see all this? Yes, God has saw sin from the very inception of sin, maybe even through God's all-knowing, all-omnipresent self. God even anticipated our sins, our bad decisions, our broken, uh, dysfunctional ways of living, and that's why God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, who will return and make all things right one day. So you, you don't need to let what's going on in the world right now create a doubt in your mind and heart about the existence of God. I mean, there, there are times when I doubt people, but man, I don't want to doubt God. I doubt me sometimes. I doubt things. I struggle with doubt at times. But man, I just, I don't, I don't know what else to tell you except this. I mean, I hope this makes sense to you. I mean, whenever I feel doubt about God tapping me on the shoulder, whenever I feel doubt going, Ephraim, it's me doubt. <laughs> whenever I feel like doubt going like, I'm still out here, Ephraim. You think I'm going to leave, but I'll be here tomorrow knocking on your door again. So you cannot open the door today. But guess what? Doubt don't take a day off. This is what I have to remember. I have to look back and say, you know what? There were people like me that were slaves. And in the backwoods, through prayer and faith and death and brokenness, somehow they found freedom. My dad and my grandparents shared stories of growing up in the deep south in times, oh my goodness, no matter what's going on in the nation right now, I mean, when they talk about what they grew up with, I mean, I'm doing pretty good. And I go, if people can believe in God in the most horrific places, I even think right now, there are people that have already had a worship service in nations where being a Christian is illegal. Do you know how fortunate we are to have a worship service right now with no fear that military or police will come in here and arrest us for doing what we're doing right now? And so I think in my mind, if people can live in those kinds of storms, if people can live in those kinds of circumstances and cry out to God and sing to God, how can I doubt God? Jesus came to defeat doubt and give us certainty and finally, in this second truth, he came to offer adoption, security. Verse 12 says this, it says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It says in verse 13, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The reason that this line is so revolutionary is because in the culture at the time, the thought was for you to be godly, for you to be seen as righteous, it was dependent on the religious hierarchy saying that you were keeping all the right laws to be holy and righteous and godly. If you were a woman, your holiness and your righteousness was dependent not on your decision, but on your husband's decision. If you were married, you were hoping, I hope that my husband is godly enough to cover us both. I hope my husband is righteous enough so that some righteousness can extend and cover me too. You know, so, you know, you like, hey, a lot of women were like, yeah, you better pray. Yeah, you better, you better read the Torah. Oh, you better go to temple because I'm dependent on it. And if you were a child, you were dependent on the decisions, righteous or unrighteous, of your parents. So if you were born with some kind of disability in that culture, the thought was, oh, your parents must have sinned. Oh, it's crazy. I mean, that's, that's messed up. The thought was, oh, maybe the reason your life is not quite right 
is because of the unrighteousness. And this is saying, no, no, through Jesus Christ, you're, you are adopted into righteousness, into holiness. So if your parents did, weren't Christians when you were growing up, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying get over that. I mean, it's like, I have relatives right now that aren't Christians. I'm praying for them all the time. But I'm saying your salvation, your righteousness, your holiness, your compassion, your generosity is not based on your parents, your grandparents, the people People that live next door to you, the religious hierarchy of a denomination, it's in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, you have been adopted as a beloved child of God. I mean, pray for your spouse if they're not, if they don't know Jesus, but you knowing, them not knowing Jesus is not an excuse for you not knowing Jesus, is what I'm trying to say to you. He came to offer adoption. I'm so glad that God, through Christ Jesus, adopts you and I. Because you know what? An adoption is not an accident. You know, some, some births are accidents. There, there, there have been some people, they, they weren't expecting a pregnancy. It's like, surprise. I mean, I mean, they kind of, well, anyway, what I'm trying to say without taking too much time to go down a rabbit trail is, is you know, they were like, ooh, somebody pregnant. Like, there's all re reality shows now where people are like, I'm not the daddy, I'm not the daddy, and then they go on the TV show and they go, you are the father. What? You know what I mean? So it's like, surprise, yes, you. Ah. And so, you know, like, births can be like a surprise. Births can be an accident, but adoptions aren't. You ain't never heard nobody come home. Like, you know, you know what my wife would say if I came home with a baby and I was like, oh man, some dudes pulled me to the side and they was like, you need to adopt this child. And they gave me some paperwork and I filled it out and look. <laughs> like what? You know what I mean? So I mean, I've never heard of an accidental adoption. What I'm trying to say is God adopts you and I through Jesus Christ on purpose because God loves us. Amen. No mistake, no accident, no luck, grace, love. God adopts you and I. Okay, let's go here to the last essential truth about Jesus. It's found in verses 14 through 18 of John 1. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. Who is he? Point one, Jesus is God. Why he came? Two, Jesus is hope. Three, where is he now? Jesus is here. You know, this, this, is, this is the most challenging part to make a decision around. Could it be Jesus is here? And you might go, but if Jesus was here, but there's so much brokenness and violence and poverty and disease. There's so much uncivil stuff Jesus is here? Yep. And you might say, well, how can that be? Well, if you, as we explore the Gospel of John, you're going to see that when Jesus walked the earth in human form, there was poverty and disease and death and violence and division and marginalization. But yet Jesus was among us, giving sight to the blind, healing to disease, addressing poverty, addressing death, addressing division, giving dignity and empowerment and new possibility and new life. See, the issue is not, has Jesus right now in this moment eradicated all of evil? It's who Jesus is in the midst of evil. 
And it's who God desires you and I to be in the midst of evil, brokenness, poverty, division, craziness. Jesus is here. He is among us. He can be known. There is an opportunity, sisters and brothers, for you and I to discover the real Jesus and live for him and follow him. We have a decision to make, sisters and brothers. Will you know Jesus? Will you follow Jesus? Will you allow God to use you to make disciples or other Jesus followers? When I was a kid growing up in a small church with my mother and grandmother, I remember a song that the old folks used to sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. And then here's the radical line. Though none go with me, I will follow. Though we live in a world that disbelieves, that rebukes, that mocks God, I'm still going to follow. Will you decide? And when you decide, when you say yes, you'll discover new life like never before. And if you've already said yes, if you've already decided that God is real, that Jesus is God, maybe the decision for you today is to allow God to use you like never before. You're not too young for God to use you. You're not too old. Will you let God use your single life, use your marriage, use your teenage life, use your college life, use your middle school life, use your elementary school life? God is in the business of using girls and boys to do great things. God is in the business of taking the retired and refire them for greater justice and truth and life. God can use your career. God can use you. That the decision would be you have permission, God, to use me. Let's pray. If you are here today and you've never made the decision to say yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you never made that decision, but today is the day you want to do that, would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand with eyes closed. If that's you, just raise your hand. I've never made the decision to follow Jesus. I want to make that decision today. Raise your hand. If you've already made the decision to follow Jesus, but you see in this moment that you could give God permission, fuller access to your single life, to your teenage life, to your marriage, to your career, to follow more deeply, to be used on your job in school this summer. If you're willing to surrender more deeply to a God who loves you so much that your life can be a vehicle to transform lives, just raise your hand, just saying, yeah, that's, you can have me, God. You can have me. You can have me. I'm going to pray for us in just a second. And I just want you to know if you raised your hand for either one of those, or if you're realizing in your heart right now that you should have said yes, there's a table in the back that says, I raise my hand. I would encourage you to go back there for prayer. I would encourage you to go back there for resources that can help you follow Jesus like never before. Dear God, our Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, there is new life and salvation. And through the Holy Spirit, there is empowerment to live lives that live out reconciliation, empowerment, new life, truth, justice, compassion, so that the lost can be found, the broken can be blessed, the hurting can be helped. I pray that this developing, growing campus in Davis would be a shining light in darkness would take doubt away from broken souls 
and to let people know that God adopting them through Christ is no accident. Let this be done. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.